right. Welcome everyone. Welcome to living, dying and living um, here for the SAND conference. It's our first day. I hope everyone's having a wonderful time so far. I'm honored, I'm Katie Gray, and I'm honored to welcome Jerry Grace Lyons uh, for our talk today. Jerry Grace Lyons is a pioneer in the home funeral movement. She has assisted hundreds of families in welcoming their loved ones through the dying process. In 1995, she founded the educational nonprofit organization, Final Passages, which allows awareness and opportunity for the public to learn more and be assisted in conscious dying, end of life doula care, natural death rights, and green burials and more. She is a death midwife. She's a home funeral guide, a minister, an educator, a Reiki master, and she is an angel walking among us. Jerry Grace, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Um, so wonderful to be here in the SAND conference. Um, it's, just, it's just a thrilling experience. So. Yeah, well, you're coming from Sebastopol, so we're, you're tuning in live. You're not too far from Maritian Zaya, I think. Um, it's I think you offer us a very, very special opportunity to, um, obviously you are, you're very comfortable with death and death being something that many of us are not comfortable with. Um, I want to just maybe prompt you with a question because I think I want to pass this over to you. You have a lot to share with us today. I was really moved in your description of your talk um, with a statement that I think says a lot and it, and it, I think it holds a lot of um, opportunity for us to learn more and question our own fears around death. Over the past century, institutions have taken over the field of after death care. Because of this, our culture has forgotten the traditional customs and rituals that keep the family involved. And we miss the opportunities for healing and connection during the sacred transition. Jerry Grace, can you speak to us a little bit about you know, you're, you are working with ritual and the prayer and the uniting of the family and the, and the uniting the spirit back to the whole. And yet our culture has completely separated, separated us from this process and from our um, confidence and from our comfortability and, and the ritual of death. What has been your experience in this and, and what can you share about that? Well, thanks for asking. That is something that I have witnessed all the way back to my beginnings in this field, uh, when my dear friend Carolyn died 26 years ago. Um, and that was the first, the first lesson for all of us uh, was getting beyond some of those fears that most people have in our culture. It's certainly considered one of the greatest taboos in this culture, even talking about death, let alone um, have, being comfortable around a dead body. Um, and Carolyn, my friend, had left instructions when she died suddenly at age 56, saying that she wanted her friends to bring her body back home from the hospital, if that's where she died, and to take care of her, wash her, dress her, do ceremony with her. She even wrote out all the ceremonies she wanted and the flowers she loved and all kinds of things, the fragrance, um, the music she wanted played. And so we followed her instructions as much as we possibly could, brought her body home, cared for her there, and discovered through this care that there really was nothing to be afraid of. That certainly we were tense when we took her out of the body bag, but then we saw she had this very serene expression and we took her out of the body bag and we washed her dressed her and it was it was a huge opening for all of us an awakening it felt like we were doing something very ancient and the truth is we were doing something very ancient uh, people from when time began have cared for their own loved ones when they died even elephants do this <laughs> all kinds of animals do this and we have just gotten away from it so much to the point that um, we want to avoid it. We want to uh, outsource it to funeral directors and funeral homes to do this for us. 
Um, and there are times where we need to, but many times people have said to me over the years, and I have guided probably around 450 families, um, they have said um, to me after they've done this, I can't imagine doing it any other way. And it's obvious that all their fears, like mine, dropped away as they saw that there was nothing really to be afraid of. That most of the fear that people carry with them comes from stories they've heard or mostly films, movies, things they've seen on video that shows that death is very much ghoulish, morbid, um, the walking dead, all these uh, stories that Edgar Allan Poe stories and such um, that scare people uh, and think that the, the, the body is going to dis well, really mostly I think they're afraid that it's going to um, look bad after a few hours, that it's going to decompose in front of their eyes. And that's a myth. It's not true. Um, after helping hundreds of families, I can tell you for sure, if, if nothing else, people start to look more peaceful and even a lot have smiles on their face. And this is the truth. Families point it out to me all the time. They see a smile appear on their loved one's face within the first couple of days and a, or an expression of serenity. So um, this began to change in me after caring for my friend Carolyn. And I recognized that there was something wrong with this picture that we have in our culture where the body's just whisked away after a couple hours. And, and people have no time to say goodbye. And there is no time limit in California and in many states in this um, where all states actually allow families to be able to bathe their loved one and dress them and spend some hours with them. Um, and in our state, there is absolutely no limit of time. So most families spend at least three days with them. So um, this helps with the healing, uh, the acceptance of death, the processing of it. Um, we just can't quite grasp that the person has died within the first couple of hours. Um, it's even though we've been preparing, even though the person maybe has been dying for weeks, months, years even, um, and now this moment comes and there's still this sense of shock and disbelief that is there living in us. And, and so it's through that process of washing their body and dressing them and having some ceremony of some kind in the house. And it doesn't have to be elaborate. It can be very simple. And sometimes even just lying in the room and sitting with them is enough because we need time. The cells in our body need something visceral to experience the death, that the death has occurred. And even then, families will say to me, I could swear I saw their chest rise and fall. Um, that they're still breathing. And in truth, I say to them, perhaps they are still breathing. Um, we are luminous bodies. We have energetic bodies around our physical body. And those energetic bodies take time to also close down and complete their process. And so I believe their energetic bodies are still breathing for a while. So it's, it may be true that they're seeing their chest rise and fall. So this, this first experience, it opened me to new possibilities. It took a while, didn't happen overnight, but I wanted to go and share the story immediately with people. Um, I told this to one of our friends who is part of the Reiki group I belong to. And Carolyn, my friend, was the leader of it. She was the Reiki teacher. And I said to um, one of the women in our group, I just want to tell everyone what this experience was like. And she, being very intuitive and psychic, said to me, and you will. And I said, what do you mean? <laughs> and she said, 
Caroline has big plans for you. <laughs> I had no idea what she was talking about. Um, that I would be sharing that story with thousands and thousands of people over the next 25 years. So that's that was the beginnings. And uh, now uh, every family that I have guided, and really it's the family who's in charge. I'm not. I'm there to support them, sometimes guide them. Um, I'm there to let them know that if, you know, if they have any questions, if they need any assistance, I'm right there walking beside them. But each, each family, through their innovation, through their inspiration, through their, um, even in the depth of their grief, they have come up with amazing ways to honor their loved ones. Through decorating of caskets, through creating altars, um, in their home, through ceremony, through the many ways we have found to um, anoint their bodies with oils, um, preserve their body using ice. Um, all of the rituals they've come up with have taught me through the years so that I could turn around and teach others. So now I have also had the grand privilege of education, teaching hundreds of people who have come through our workshops. Um, I created three levels of the work. Um, the first level is all about conscious dying, how to prepare for our own death, um, what kinds of fears we have around death, our concerns, and dealing with these things in depth, uh, self-exploration, and going as, as deep as we can go is to, to find out what lives within each one of us around the subject of death. And then how to care for others, not in a medical way, but in a way that um, can really bring out all the ways in which this person contributed, is um, ha led a meaningful life, has touched people, has gifted them um, with with what they've brought into the world. And then we go on to level two, which is the post-death care. And then um, the, the washing, dressing, anointing, the ceremony. Um, also many options for um, end of life, the um, disposition, we call it. And it's uh, either like green burial, which is the one we choose, anything that's more green. But many people choose cremation, and that's fine. We just meet people with whatever they, their desire is. Um, and also many new things coming down um, the pike for uh, ways, uh, as a matter of fact, next month, um, Recompose in, this, in Seattle, Washington area will be opening its doors for the very first time. Katrina Spade, who started that um, particular thing is a uh, recompose is about um, having our bodies naturally break down in inorganic material inside of a vessel and it happens quickly within a month the body is reduced to soil which can then be used for um, the ground and so um, so many things are going back to a more natural custom um, more natural, relevant, meaningful ways of dealing with the body and um, with families being involved, as you said. So, um, wow. <laughs> that's a lot, a lot, of, a lot of words. <laughs> oh, it's so good. I, I, what, I'm just blown away because I think of, um, I, I was actually just sitting here kind of enamored and in reverence for you because of, you know, we think in our culture of what fearlessness is, you know, it's, you know, this strong, physically strong military force that can just go and impact. And you are, you are not afraid of death. You are not afraid of holding space within the realms of what I think probably as a species is the thing we fear more than anything is death. And I think what a powerful, courageous um, path you have taken and, and you have embodied in your life. It's, it's profound to witness your ease with the topic and the presence of death. 
Um, I wanted to ask a, a question. You, you have more to share with us and you're actually going to be sharing some images with us to help shift our cellular traumatic imprint that, that media has inflicted onto our conscious and our subconscious mind. I wanted a, a quick question. When you speak of um, the importance of uh, families overcoming uh, the death and the dying, and then their experience afterwards feeling maybe surprised that it was so beautiful and that it was nothing to fear and that you know each of the people present each of the family members present I imagine have an awakening within themselves of a confrontation with something that they were previously afraid of would you say that in your experience that confronting dying gives us permission to live more fully to confront living if we confront that which we're most afraid of Absolutely. Um, I often speak of the fear of death like a, a, a program running behind this, the scenes on our computer. We have a program we don't even know that's slowing things down, uh, bogging it down, causing all kinds of problems in the computer. And that's because there's this, this program running behind the scenes that we're not even aware of. So it's the same thing with death. Death is... Um, something people don't want to talk about, but yet we're all aware that we're going to die. On some level, our consciousness is fully aware that one day this body is not going to, it's not going to be breathing anymore. Our heart isn't going to be beating anymore. Um, so in, unless we're really talking about it and confronting it, as you say, that's like a program running behind the scenes that, that, causes us to not run true or resonate perfectly with life. And so if we aren't looking at death or talking about it at all, then it's, it's interfering with how we live our life in some way, even though we're completely unconscious about it. So it lives in our unconscious and we can't fully embrace life and what, what it's about. That's when we talk about conscious dying a lot in our first level of our classes. We ask people, what is conscious dying? And so that's that discussion. That's that, the meat of that is um, that it's people being awake and aware about death and willing to talk about it and willing to prepare for it as though it could happen tomorrow because guess what? It can. And that's exactly what happened to my friend Carolyn. 56 years old, went to work like any other day to care for an 80-year-old woman as a nurse. And the next thing you know, she's she wasn't feeling well. They called 911, and she died. She wasn't expecting to die that day she went to work, but she did. So if we aren't willing to look at it and deal with it, um, we can't fully be here, present, for ourselves or anybody else. Um, and this is why it's such an important thing to look at and talk about. Um, and we're not saying everybody has to have a home funeral. That's what, that's the term that my friend Janelle and I coined, um, home funeral, and it's stuck. But it's a family-directed home funeral. And not everybody is going to want to do that. Um, but if people don't know that it even exists, that they don't have that as a choice, they can't really make a fully informed decision about how they want to have that last scene play out in their life. So we're just trying to present all the choices, all the options, and why they may want to choose that, why it could be such a, an important choice to make. Um, and how it can help them release those fears and really embrace um, honoring the person in a loving way. It also, of course, brings community into the scene. So we're going back to more of a village concept where we walk each other home, as everybody knows that expression from Ram Dass, um, where each of us are walking beside each other in this time. I'd love to be able to show some images if that would work out right now, because um, I have a lot of them. I'm going to go pretty fast. 
Um, is that okay, Katie, if I do that? Absolutely. I think speaking to what you're, you're sharing and, and speaking to all of, all of us together in this circle right now, what she's saying, you know, is that we've been so traumatized with this imagery of, of gruesome, gory, horrific um, understandings of death and that's imprinted in our minds. So Jerry Grace is offering us an opportunity to have a new look, a new understanding, to have new stamps and new imprints into our subconscious to replace the old. Perfect. Thank you. Yes. Um, so I'm going to go through these fairly quickly um, because I have a lot of them. And it's basically just to get a sense of how beautiful, colorful, meaningful, loving, um, how people cherish um, their loved ones, how, they're, um, how they want to celebrate and honor them. So I'm going to go through these. First ones are pictures of people painting caskets for their loved one who died. And I started out with a child because children are also welcome into the scene of a family-directed home funeral. They love it. They love getting involved in every different way you can imagine. Um, I've seen a little six-year-old washing the chest of his little his daddy up on the bed. Um, so kids love to paint, and this is this is one. And this is uh, a group of 11-year-old boys. Um, the, one of them, his mother died, who was 38 from cancer, and he brought all his friends over to decorate their box. Same box. People love to do handprints receiving the body into loving hands. Lots of people like photographs on the box. This is a pine box in a church. Another pine box, the woman, there's a picture of the woman stenciling her own box as she is approaching her own death. Um, she was able to decorate her own box and friends stopped by to help. And this is the hall they rented for this celebration after she died and she's inside the casket there. This was airbrushed cardboard casket. Man who died from, um, he was a, he was a car, a uh, race car driver, but he died from a heart attack. Um, but people, you know, pick up the theme of their life. And this was uh, decoupage. A woman painted it for her mother. Inside of the casket, beautiful materials laid. The outside. The inside lid where this woman's mother would be looking up at clouds while she was lying in her box and the outside going off into the sunset. A pine box inside an ancient small church, taking someone to the crematorium in, a, in their van. This man was claustrophobic, so his wife cut out the hole, the top of the lid of the box and, and posted a note that said, if you wanna get out, push here. So there's humor that shows up in lots of deaths, always, almost always. Um, this man uh, made this box for his mother with um, a, an iris carved in the middle. It's got uh, angel wings taking the box to the crematorium. <laughs> and uh, amongst all those that are just plain. This is my mom. She died three years ago. We brought her home. We tied her mouth closed um, till rigor mortis set in. Um, she looks 97 and a half there, <laughs> which she was. But also what we see is through the loving care that families give to people, they, they completely transform. And you'll see that in the next pictures. And that's her after. She looks 20 or 30 years younger to me my whole family coming and the threshold choir came to sing for my mom i'm part of the threshold choir and we sing at the bedside of people who are dying and also to honor them after they've died my sister my um, next door neighbors who are my landlords and they helped us put her in her pine box and james reynolds um who's um 
lives next door, is a great artist. And I asked him to paint a rose on the box because my mom's name is Rose. So he did. And that was an amazing rose. <laughs> and then my great nephews painted their contribution. And they called her Gaga because that was her great grandma. And there she is. And then this, her friend Verna, um, because Janelle and I used to be roommates, so Verna and my mom became good friends. Verna is Janelle's mom. So here's a couple of pic old pictures of Verna and my mom having a good time together. And then when Verna died, she was 95, and um, Janelle brought her home from the skilled nursing facility. I helped her, and then she had this home funeral for her at her home. Entering the castle. She put that book there. I loved it. And you can see how sweet and tender people are with their loved ones. It's, you can see, see what a serene expression she had. Her good friend Joy, who is near her own passing, um, painted this beautiful pine box lid. Putting stuff in the box with her, putting the lid on with her husband, saying her last goodbye. This is Brian. He was 40. He was hit on his motorcycle by a drunk driver in a truck. Um, everybody got together, and they're all here dressing, dressing him. His wife on the left, Kirsten, she was 33 years old. He was 40. Everybody trying together, dressing him and preparing him. And this is an adopted son, but they had a, reg a, a biological son who was 15. And um, then bringing him in the house and placing him in a window seat, decorating him with flowers. So beautiful, amazing. And I just wanted to show you this man because, as I mentioned, many of the people have smiles on their face after they die. Well, here's one of them. You're going to see a few more. It looks almost like he's about to burst out laughing to me. Um, we see that so many times. Um, people change the way a room looks and feels by just putting a shawl over a lamp. This man was definitely smiling when we walked in, and this was 12 hours after he died. This woman looked like an angel. People put all kinds of things in the casket with the person. Um, people all ages. This is a granddaughter putting makeup on her 90-year-old grandmother. And um, this woman. Uh, everybody came in and wrote things on ribbons, um, notes to the woman who died, and then they laid them across her. Um, they covered her with a veil when they were out of the room. This man was an architect. And he's in the living room under his architectural, beautiful, I don't even know what to call that, but it was so incredible. Um, I love the pictures. And they everybody decorated the box like Day of the Dead. Um, and his wife died a few months later from cancer. And she is not alive in this picture. It's hard to believe, but she looks with her eyes open. She just looks so serene, so beautiful. And then friends put makeup on her and prepared the next step. And that's her transformed even more. Just incredible, huh? And this is my friend Deanna, and she died in January this year. And I was with her in Maui and a dear, dear friend of mine. And she took medicine because she had cancer and was in so much pain. And so she chose to ask for um, the end of life option and took medicine. We were all with her. Um, this is when she's still alive. Good friend Nirja in the picture and uh, other friends visiting before she took her medicine. Many sacred people came in and did prayers with her. Sixteen of us were in the room with her when she took her medicine. And afterwards, you can see they decorated her feet and just can, continued to put more and more lays around her. Every day they changed, every day the, they grew and changed. And then finally it was time to go to the crematorium. And so we placed her in the box everybody had decorated. And um, 
So that was my friend Deanna, and this is um, Nancy, and I think this is the last one. Now this woman has died. She is, she's grinning. <laughs> she's she's um, she has now been dead for a time. So this is how beautiful people can look. And this is her 90-year-old mother saying her goodbye. Her her um, boyfriend who's saying his goodbyes. And then they all her friends wrapped her in shroud, beautiful material. They all brought and spontaneously wrapped her for her burial. And then these are friends of the family, um, placing her in the pine box that was going to the cemetery. Um, the side walls of the casket were taken away so that she would just be lowered in this pine uh, plank um, into the grave. And so it would be green. That's her son who is turned 33 on that day, saying their last goodbyes, walking her over the grave, lowering her. And then that's it. And the kids all helping fill in the grave. Everybody does. Oh, wow. <laughs> I don't know if anyone else is crying right now. That was really beautiful. Just deep, deep tears of, of um, I think, inside of us. Because we only have two minutes left. Mm -hmm. Grace, I want to say that, that maybe you guys can just nod if that was a really powerful experience for you. Yeah. Um, to, how important for us to see this contrast, to see... Um, it's as if you just opened up the floodgates of truth and allowed us to look at something so necessary. Each of us will have and will have to confront death again and again. And for you to replace the, um, the negative traumatic, um, uh, I guess just the, the frightening gore of death to say it's actually something so beautiful. What, a, what powerful work that is. What a powerful gift for all of us to have in our hearts and in our, in our psyches now. Thank you. And I, I just want to say, <clears throat> if people feel a calling, as I did, to this work, um, we are co constantly teaching workshops. Please go to finalpassages.org. Um, we have, um, if you want to learn how to guide a family, as I have done with hundreds, um, we have uh, our level two, uh, which you can take even if you haven't taken level one, just talk to me. And um, that's in November, November 13th through 15th. So please. Um, is it live? Or does it, can it be online or is it, do we need to? It's online right now during COVID, of course. Um, but as soon as, you know, COVID's done, um, we'll look. Whenever that happens, we'll look to see to have maybe not as many in-person workshops, but we'll have a couple in the year. But we just finished level one and it was phenomenal online. It was phenomenal. And I have videos of how to care for the body online so people can see exactly how it's done. And um, and we can teach you right from, from our living room. We can teach you how to do it. Sally Shannon is my assistant. Um, instructor and she will be working with me on all the online courses so um, please come join us we'd love to have more of you out there Mary Grace if you get it and we're gonna say goodbye but please check in the chat feed everyone has um, given their they want to say thank you to you so if you get a chance look at all of the thank yous okay. and thank you everyone for joining us with a powerful circle um, Jerry Grace thank you once again and um, here's to more days and more upcoming for the dying and living here with sand thank you yes blessings blessings on all of you mm -hmm.